Hello. Thank you, everybody, for joining me for this talk, From Zero to Deployment with Elixir. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Philip, and I would like to tell you quickly what it is that I do. I am the founder of a small software company called Pentacent, and I lead the European technology team at Volt Europa. Now, Pentacent, okay, that's clear. It's a software company, but what is Volt Europa? Volt Europa is a progressive political movement, and it was founded two years ago in the wake of Brexit with the intent to improve and reform the European Union. As the European tech lead, I coordinate uh, all of our development efforts when it comes to our internal communication tools or our members' database. Currently, we are using a tech stack that is based on Ruby on Rails, uh, and we are very busy in keeping everything uh, up and running for the coming elections in May. But after that, we will reevaluate our tech stack, and who knows, maybe Elixir is going to be in the mix for that. Um, if you have any questions about Vault or if you're interested in helping out uh, this movement, please come to me and talk after the talk because we're always looking for new people. What do I do if I don't volunteer my time for Vault? I run a software company called Pentacent. We're a very small company, a very small team of developers and researchers. And at this point, we're using Elixir exclusively for our projects uh, and also in production. The project we're working on currently is called Now.do. And I like to think of it as a personal productivity mentor. For this project, we've done loads of research in, on the science behind motivation, productivity, and emotional well-being. As you've heard already, I have a background in psychology, so this is a topic very close to my heart. This application ties together to-do lists, a calendar and time tracking, and combines it with personalized suggestions on how to make you more productive and happier even. And all of this is based on our psychological research. Enough about me. Let's talk about you. Who is this talk for? I have decided to give this talk to share my experiences developing Elixir applications with people who are in a similar situation. I work in a small team. I used to work as a single developer. And if you love programming, but you're not all that fond of tending to servers uh, and updating them and you know, just keeping an eye on them, then this presentation will hopefully be helpful to you. When people talk about deployment, I think too often they love to bring out the big guns. You know, I'm talking about distributed systems and Kubernetes clusters. This is not what I'm going to be talking about. As people who work in small teams, or who work alone even, we don't have access to an IT operations team. We can't tell someone, hey, why don't you dispatch the server cluster for us? Instead, we have to do everything ourselves. And uh, so I will be trying to show you a technique uh, for deploying applications that is very feasible for small teams and single developers. But even if you're working in a larger corporate environment, not all of your applications necessarily need to have that same global scale, and maybe it can also be useful for you if you want to build a smaller application. Two years ago, we had just deployed our first Elixir application. Because I wanted to avoid managing servers as much as possible, I decided to run it on a platform as a service. That was quite convenient. I didn't have to worry about server updates or database backups because all that was being taken care of by the service provider. It was great, until it wasn't. After a couple of months, they were rolling out an update to their platform that broke our application. It killed our application and prevented it from starting again. There was nothing I could do. It took them several days to fix the issue and they had awful customer support. There was no way to reach them. But of course, I didn't wait several days until they had fixed the issue. I realized that this was not a situation that I wanted to be in. Locked in with a single service provider, dependent on them being able to fix a bug that they had created. Unfortunately, our deployment process at the time was very much tailored to that specific platform, which made switching to a different provider quite difficult. But eventually, I managed to move the application to a simple cloud server, and our downtime was limited to a mere 36 hours. I mean, there's only so much you can do in uh, one night of not sleeping. It was then that I started my quest to come up with a simple method to deploy our applications to any server, regardless of provider or platform. 
I started researching and writing blog posts about the topic, and eventually I came to the conclusion that what I needed was simple atomic deployments. Why simple? Nobody likes complicated things. Why atomic? Let me back off a bit. There are really two philosophies when it comes to running servers. You can see them as your friend and build a long-term relationship with your server. You can update them, you tend to them, maybe you even love them. Or you can see your servers as an expendable commodity, a tool that merely exists as a vessel for your code. This is what I wanted. I want to focus on building applications, not on maintaining servers. But when deployments are not fully self-contained and atomic, there can always be some hidden state on your server uh, without which your application wouldn't run. So maybe your application is running fine on one server, but if the deployment isn't truly atomic, if you try to redeploy it on another server, maybe something on that server it was running on before was necessary to run the application and now it's not working anymore. This is why I want my deployments to be atomic. How can this be achieved? With OTP releases and with Docker. What are they? And how do they work? This is what this talk is about. Let's begin with OTP releases. Like so many things in the Elixir universe, releases are something that has been part of the Erlang universe for a long, long time. But what exactly are they? Let's see what the Erlang docs have to say about this topic. When you have written one or more applications, you might want to create a complete system with these applications and a subset of the Erlang slash OTP applications. This is called a release. Hmm. What does that actually mean? Many of you are probably familiar with Ruby, JavaScript, or PHP. These languages are all interpreted languages. And thus, when you want to deploy them, you take your source code, you take your interpreter, and there you go. But Erlang and Elixir are compiled languages. They need to be compiled to bytecode before the Erlang virtual machine, Beam, can run them. Now, you could just install the entire development toolchain on your target system compile your application there, and run it like you would do locally. But this would be very inefficient, because most of the development toolchain is not actually necessary to run your application. This is where releases come in. They are essentially bundles of bytecode, some metadata and scripts. They are the smallest functioning version of your application. You can even include the Erlang runtime, uh, runtime system application, ERTS, and then you don't even need to have Erlang installed on the target machine. Many of you are probably familiar with Go binaries. They're awesome. They can be completely static and with zero external dependencies. You might have seen them on certain projects on GitHub. You download them, you run them on any Linux machine. They work fine every time. Releases are not that. They do have some dependencies, mainly on the C standard library that your version of the Erlang runtime was built with. And if you're using the crypto application for HTTPS, for example, then uh, it also depends on OpenSSL. So a release is also a collection of multiple files rather than a single binary. So you can really think of them more as app bundles on macOS that are folders with a bunch of files and libraries needed to run an application, but not with all libraries needed to run the application. So to summarize, releases are mostly self-contained bundles that contain your compiled application with very few dependencies. Almost done with the talking. Let's build something. Since this, call is ta uh, since, since this talk is called From Zero to Production, let's start from zero as well. I tried to come up with a very simple piece of code that could barely uh, be considered an application. So I decided to build something very boring, a clock. All it does is print out the application version number and the current time, over and over again, forever, at a specified interval. So let's start. Let's create a new mix project. We find all the files we expect in an empty mix project. Awesome. Let's make our mix project an OTP application. 
Remember that the term application is used differently in the context of Erlang than you might be familiar with that word from other contexts. An application is something that can be loaded, started, and stopped. So in many cases, you can think of an application as um, a library, what, uh, which is what you would call it in many other languages. So let's configure our mix project um, to become an application. We take mix.exs, the project configuration file, and we add to the application function this mod keyword. What does that do? It tells Elixir that the clock module is going to be the module it needs to load for the application. Then we need to actually implement the application behavior. So let's create the file that contains the clock module. We implement the application behavior by calling use application, and then we start, uh, then we provide the start callback in which we start our gen server, which is called clock.server in the supervision tree. Next, I said we want it to print out the time at a specified interval, and for this, we're gonna use mix configuration. So in our mix config file, we simply put the keyword interval at 1000 milliseconds uh, for our clock application. And last but, last but not least, we implement the business logic. I mean, it's not much business here, but you know, you get the idea. We create the module called clock.server, and it implements the gen server behavior. It defines three functions, start link, init, and handle info. Start link starts the gen server. Init initializes the gen server with an initial state. And in our case, the state, as you can see in the function, is going to be a map with the interval read from our application uh, environment, so from our mix configuration. Then we return the tuple OK state timeout. And since we provide the timeout value, it is going to trigger the handle info timeout callback, in which we retrieve the date, version, and print it out. Then again, we return the no reply state and interval tuple, but this time the interval tuple is gonna be whatever interval was stored in our state. Let's give this a quick try. Can you see that fine? Or is it too small? Okay, so not very interesting. It prints out the time, amazing, right? Let's build a release from this. Oh, but maybe let's go back to the presentation first. You could build a release using native Erlang time tools because like I've said, they've been around for a long time. There are tools called SysTools and RHEL, and you can use them to build uh, a release. But they're complicated to use, they involve a lot of manual work, and they're not very ad well adapted for Elixir. This is where a module called Distillery comes in. It was created by Paul Schoenfelder, better known as Bitwalker in the Elixir community, and it nicely integrates releases into Mix. All we have to do to turn our OTP application into a release is add Distillery to our dependencies. We install the dependencies. And then we call mixrelease.init, which initializes the release. What does it do? It creates a new folder called rel in our application, in our project folder, which contains a new configuration file and another file called vm.args. Let's see what happens if we do that. So a whole bunch of stuff is happening here. As you can see, um, Distillery finds all the applications that are the dependencies of our application, for example, the Elixir kernel, distillery itself, the Erlang runtime tools, and so on and so forth. Then it takes all of these and their respective dependencies and puts them into this somewhat obscure folder uh, here. Okay, what's in that folder? Let's take a look. Well, we have a folder called underscore build prod rel clock, 
not very intuitive, but it's actually easy to understand. Clock is the name of our release. Rel stands for release, obviously, and prod for the mix, uh, the mix environment production. In this folder, we find another folder called releases, and that folder in turn contains yet another folder with the version number of our release, in this case, 0.1.0. .0. In there, we find a couple of files. Clock.rel, this is the resource file. It includes information about which applications are included in this release. We find the boot script, which is called clock.script, and clock.boot, it's actually the same script, just once in binary representation. We find vm.args, which are the parameters used to start the Erlang virtual machine. And we find a folder called hooks, with several subfolders, I've cut them out, there's just one here. Uh, they're all called pre-start, post-start, and so on and so forth, .d. Now, you might be familiar with etc, uh, init.d on uh, Unix saw its systems. And pretty much like these folders, they can contain um, scripts that are run at specific times in your application release. Now, the most interesting part is a file called clock.tar.gz. This tar archive actually contains our release, and it is the artifact that we will ultimately use to deploy our application. What else is in there? ERTS is in there. So the Erlang runtime, including Beam, uh, which runs our application. We have a folder called lib, which contains all of our code and dependencies compiled as bytecode. And we have a folder called bin. And in that folder bin, we find clock, which is the entry point to our application. Now, we can call this entry point with a couple of uh, commands, and I will show you uh, what they all do. Not all of them, but a couple of them. So, the simplest one of them is called console clean. It initializes an IEX session within the context of your application without actually starting it. Let's try that. So now we have an IEX shell here. Better now? And to show you that we are actually in the context of our application, we can read from our configuration. As you can see, we find the configuration we've put in there that is 1,000 milliseconds as the interval. Next, we can use foreground. And as you might suspect, this launches our application in the foreground, and now it's running here forever and ever. Let's use the second terminal here to try some other commands. First of all, let's try restart. As the name implies, it restarts your application. But it doesn't restart the Erlang virtual machine. As you can see, the process in the other terminal is still running, but it has reinitialized everything. It restarted the entire supervision tree. Opposed to this is reboot, which does restart the Erlang virtual machine, so it's going to stop working on the left. But it's still running. And in order to terminate that, we can call stop. All right, enough clock. Now, you see, all I, did, all I did was call a mix command in order to achieve this. But of course, you can configure your release a little bit more. Because um, maybe you don't, you're not uh, entirely happy with the uh, settings you get out of the box. So let's take a look at how we can customize the creation of our releases. You saw earlier that there's a file called config.exs in the rel folder. And in there, we specify profiles. Profiles are a combination of a release and an environment. And it's important to note that environments in distillery are distinct from, from environments in Mix. So you know, Mix has environments, but uh, distillery actually has distinct environments. Though for convenience's sake, by default, they are the same. That's why you see their default underscore environment is Mix.env. Um, Let's take a look at what the actual settings are that we can create. 
So for our production environment, we say we don't want to include the source code. And it wouldn't be very useful anyways because it only includes Erlang source code for compatibility reasons. Elixir source code is not ever included. Dev mode is an interesting uh, function. It lets you build the re releases slightly quicker because it doesn't actually copy them to the release folder. Instead, it just creates uh, links. Include ERTS is pretty self-explanatory, I think. It includes ERTS in your release, so you don't have to have Erlang installed on the target machine. In the next line, we set the Erlang cookie. And you're probably um, aware of what the Erlang cookie is. It is also called the Erlang magic cookie, and it is a shared secret for distributed systems. So you should keep it a secret and not commit it to your uh, source control. Then finally, we define the release for our application called clock. We set the version of the release, and this is very important because every release needs to be identified uniquely by a version. And then we set uh, the applications key and define which applications should be included in this release. And that is interesting because if you have an umbrella application, you can actually split them however you like. You can include all of your child applications in a release, or you can create multiple releases with some of them in any which one you like. In this case, we only have one application, so we don't need to do anything uh, specific there. Next, I already mentioned earlier when we looked at the file structure of the release uh, that you can have lifecycle hooks. They're, like I said, very similar to etc init.d, and they are the following. Pre and post configure get called around the time that uh, distillery applies configuration to your application. Pre start and post start around the start of your application, and pre and post stop around when you stop your application. Let's add one of these hooks. So we just create a new script in this folder called pre-start. And then we add this configuration to our release configuration. You can also create custom commands. If you are not happy with just having the foreground and uh, start command, you can do anything you like. Like you could create a command for uh, migrations or for maintenance tasks that you would like to trigger manually. Alternatively, you can also use hooks for these things. So you're really free to design the system however you like. This is how you define a command. Just specify the link, uh, the, the path to a shell script that is should, supposed to be run. Now, application configuration is amazing in Elixir, and it's also terrible. Why? Because mixed configuration is very convenient to, to work with, but it's compiled at runtime. And if you're using environment variables, that is not very practical, is it? Because you are not going to have the same environment variables on your uh, build machine or on your local machine as you're going to have on your deployment server. Fortunately, Distillery 2.0 that came out in September 2018 has a very nice solution for that, and that is configuration providers. Before that, there was only one option called replace OS vars, which uh, replaces environment variables in these weird-looking strings in case you have set the environment variable replace OS vars to true. Otherwise, this cookie would be the literal string that is written here. Now, with configuration providers, we can simply add a mix configuration that is supposed to be evaluated at runtime. You don't really need to remember um, this code here because you can just look it up in the uh, documentation. But it is uh, possible to use these configuration providers with JSON, YAML, um, or even with external endpoints. You can create any configuration provider you'd like. Let's create one ourselves. Um, or we are not actually going to create a uh, configuration provider. We are just using the mix configuration provider. So we create this new mix configuration file in which we read the interval from the environment and then turn it into an integer. Now, one cool thing you can do with releases is hot upgrades. We've changed a couple of things in our code now. Um, And we might want to create a new release of our application. But you don't actually have to restart your application. You can switch out the code while it is running. This is the same thing that Phoenix does when it does uh, live reloading of modules, or that you can do in IEX when you use R to reload a module. For this, you need an app up file, which is an Erlang term that describes how to upgrade and downgrade your application. 
Fortunately, we don't have to create it because the distillery does it automatically. But if you wanted to, you could do it manually as well. While your code gets upgraded, your state doesn't get upgraded. So if you have uh, a gen server that is running, the state does not change through the code upgrades. So you can define this callback here that will then um, upgrade your application, or uh, will, will then modify your state uh, when your application gets upgraded. As you can see here, we just make it reload the initial configuration. So this is also pretty straightforward. We just call mixed release with the upgrade parameter. And then we could uh, run our application again and uh, call upgrade, and it would upgrade. Let's try it. So now we've created the new release. Um, you cannot actually do the live upgrade from, from the build folder. So I'm going to quickly copy everything to a new folder. So you can see our clock is running there, version 0.1.0. .0. And it's upgraded. It's still running, but now our callback was called. It says a new version was loaded, and now version 2.0 is running. Amazing. I mean, it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> but unfortunately, we're not going to use this because we will be using Docker for our deployment. And uh, Docker does not allow us to use these uh, kinds of fancy tricks because the deployments are going to be atomic. So there will be no state, and these releases are inherently stateful. You're probably all familiar with Docker. It is an operating system level virtualization that uh, is basically a thin layer on top of your operating system. And yeah. <laughs> There are, of course, some advantages and disadvantages to using Docker. The advantage is obviously it's almost fully self-contained. It's very easily repeatable if you want to do a deployment, and it's very fast. It has a small overhead. But like I said, you can do hot upgrades. And if you have very long running uh, connections, they will break if you do a new upgrade. Let's quickly take a look at building a Docker image. So when you build a Docker image, you usually use a base and uh, then call some commands in there. In this case, we're just creating a very simple Docker image that will uh, function as IEX. So we start this Docker image, and then uh, we will have an instance of IEX running like this. Now I'm going to skip this because we're a bit short in time. Let's take a look at how I like to build my Docker containers for deployment. So I use a multi-stage Docker file approach. What does that mean? You can define multiple um, images to be built in a Docker file. And this is what it looks like. You start a new image by using the from command. In this case, we're using Elixir, uh, the Elixir image to build our application. And then we do everything that's necessary in order to actually build it and extract the clock.tar.gz, which you can see in the last line, and copy it to a more convenient folder. Then we create the next container in the same Docker file. We copy the file from the previous image and put it in opt-app. But this time, we are not using the Elixir image, which has all the development tools, but just the Alpine Linux image. And this is pretty convenient because it creates a very, very tiny image that is entirely self-contained. And once we add this Docker file to our project, we can run it with Docker build. Um, and we can target clock. All right. Um, we're almost there. Almost have it on our server. Um, we've built the release. Let's put it on a server. Where? 
We could use a platform as a service, we could use a managed container, container service, or we just use a regular old VPS. I like using Docker Compose on VPSs. Docker Compose makes it much easier to manage um, a Docker container and even have dependencies between Docker containers. So this is what my um, deployment setup typically looks like, and this would be working for our clock application right now. We simply need one Docker Compose file. We specify which um, image we want to load and the environment variables we need. Alongside with it, you create a file called called .env, in which you specify the environment variables that you want to load. There you go, this is all you need. These two files are everything you need after you've built, it the, release, after you've built the release uh, in order to run it on your server. You can integrate other servers, could run MariaDB, Postgres, Redis, whatever, and make them dependencies of your application. And then you call Docker Compose up, and everything goes up. There we go. Now our application is running inside of Docker through Docker Compose. And that's really all there is. Releases are awesome. Atomic deployments are awesome. Docker Compose is awesome. I think they're a great fit if you're a small team and you don't want to worry about your servers too much. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is it okay? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to ask you if you tried to do uh, any kind of auto upgrades with Docker. Um, that's an interesting question, but you can't really do that because you want, because the Docker containers are immutable, and if you start introducing additional state to the Docker com containers, you're really um, going besides the point of the Docker container, and then you lose the advantages you have with them. And then you might as well just use Docker to build your application and deploy it to a server that is not using Docker for running your application. Okay, so are you dealing with the downtime deployments? Sorry? Uh, uh, deployments with downtime? Yes, unfortunately, if you do Docker deployments, you will have to use something like blue-green um, deployment in order to minimize downtime, but there will be a minimal downtime. Okay, thank you. So I, I know that one of the side effects of uh, doing releases with distillery is that you no longer have, have mix available in your production environment. And there's a bunch of people, and me included, that still use uh, Mix for running Ecto migrations, for example. And so what's your preferred way of running your Ecto migrations uh, for your production databases? So I like to create uh, custom commands for my application and then run the Ecto uh, migrations manually. You can simply create a module that does the migrations without using Mix. Thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I had uh, a problem with um, when I did um, create the migration for uh, these upgrades that I didn't create the up up the app up file. So, do you already face that issue at some point or? Not really, because typically Distillery is quite good at figuring out how to manually create the app up file. But if you do have problems, you can use a new command that was introduced in Distillery 2.0, uh, where you have Distillery create the app up file beforehand, and then you can look at it and modify it if there's a problem with it. Okay. Thanks. By the way, I've, uh, I'm going to put up the slides on this link. Um, they're also going to be on the ElixirConf website, but I'm also going to put them on my website. So I wanted to ask, it, when you define the Docker file, you have an entry point, and do you usually use a uh, hard in production or some way to supervise the process, or do you just don't do that? No, I don't do that. Okay. I, I use the foreground uh, command as the entry point, or like I, I use the entry point that Distillery creates, and then use the foreground command. So you don't use anything to supervise the process. 
And if the process becomes unresponsive or something like this? Uh, well, I mean, Docker Compose has uh, a possibility to uh, restart processes when they crash. So that's what I'm doing. OK. Done. Oh, thanks. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>